Late on the afternoon of Saturday, March 25th, 1911, the 500 employees of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company were racing to fill their quotas. Teenage girls, for the most part, eager to finish up, collect their pay, and plunge into the mild spring evening. Around 4.45 p.m., with just 15 minutes left in the workday, someone on the eighth floor must have dropped a match or burning cigarette into the heaps of discarded fabric that littered the shop floor. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory occupied the top floors of a 10-story building, and a fire broke out. Apparently, someone had dropped a cigarette into a drawer that held what they called remnants of scraps of cloth, and uh, the fire spread pretty quickly. And the doors were locked, uh, allegedly to keep out union organizers. This had you know, been a company that resisted unionization was trying to. Uh, so with this rapidly spreading fire, there was really very little way to get out. Uh, and the result was a horrible carnage. Within seconds, the combustible litter of cloth and tissue paper had burst into flames. And before anyone could stop it, the fire began to spread with startling speed from one stack of fabric to another. As cries of panic went out and terrified workers scrambled for the exits. I heard somebody cry fire. I ran for the door on the Washington Place side. But the door was locked, and immediately there was a great jam of girls before it. Some girls were screaming. Some were beating the door with their fists. Some were trying to tear it open. Rosie Saffron. It was horrifying. It was a large loft. Um, in which the doors had been locked from the outside. And so when the fire began, um, the women working at the machines tried to get out of the exits, could not um, move the doors. And uh, there are accounts of bodies being crushed up against the doors and of women trying to escape. Most workers on the 10th floor managed to escape helped to safety across an adjoining rooftop by students from New York University. Hundreds more made it down by elevator. 30 people at a time jammed into cars meant to hold half that number. But by 4.55, the searing heat had forced the last of the elevators out of service. And with the fire now spreading from the eighth floor to the ninth, nearly 200 women remained trapped in the building with no means of escape. On the eighth floor, workers tried bravely to stop the fire, but the flames were too quick, and the water pressure in the fire hoses failed them. As the searing heat and smoke intensified, the factory floor became an incinerator. And as bodies piled up in front of the locked main exit, those who still could raced for a fire escape on the far western end of the building. Fewer than 20 women managed to get out before the rusted metal supports gave way, sending several workers plunging to their death and cutting off the last means of escape for all the others. With a wall of fire advancing on them, the terrified women moved to the open windows. The girls behind us were screaming and crying. Several of them as the flames crept closer, ran into the smoke, and we heard them scream as the flames caught their clothes. One little girl who worked at the machine opposite me cried out in Italian, goodbye, goodbye, Tessa Banani. Outside on the street below, a huge crowd had gathered. The New York Fire Department had arrived within minutes of the call, rushing 35 vehicles to the scene, along with the most modern firefighting equipment in the country. But even the tallest ladder could go no farther than the sixth floor, two full stories below the burning factory floors, where tongues of flame could already be seen 
curling out of the windows. The fire, of course, like any fire in Manhattan, could be spotted from blocks and blocks around because of the smoke. So there were big crowds on the streets below, and the fire had gone on long enough that people had also heard the word down on the Lower East Side and had come up to the village waiting to see what would happen. And then it became apparent in this heart-gripping moment that no one could get out except if they jumped. At 5.05, a laborer named Dominic Cardiani, pushing his wheelbarrow down Green Street, heard a muffled explosion, followed by the sound of breaking glass. Glancing up, he saw what he thought were dark bundles of clothes sailing from an eighth floor window. You know, you can hardly believe it when you read about it. I mean, imagine from the eighth, ninth, and tenth floors of a building overlooking Washington Square Park. You know, it's, it, first, this great tongue of flame leaps out, you know, and passes by where there's some policemen said, oh, it was just a momentary accident. Then all of a sudden, one passerby said something that looked like a bale of old clothes comes plummeting down from the eighth floor and hits with this thud that somehow seemed too loud for a bale of clothes on the sidewalk. And someone said they must be throwing, and it was burning as it fell, they must be throwing out the burning bales of clothes. And then other bodies started to come down. People realized that they'd, you mean young girls would go out on the ledge. The flames would be looming up behind them, and they jump, of course, to die. Uh, some would try to cling to the ledge with their fingertips, but they couldn't. You have plummeting down to the street scores of burning dead bodies. There was also an iron fence below, so some of the young women, when they jumped, were impaled on the iron fence. And people who saw it said that they never forgot it, that it was a sight that burned itself on the retina of the watchers. William Shepard, a reporter for the United Press, called the story in as he watched from a payphone across the street. I learned a new sound, a more horrible sound than description can picture. It was the thud of a speeding, living body on a stone sidewalk. Thud. Dead. Thud. Dead. Thud. Dead. Thud. Dead. There was plenty of chance to watch them as they came down. The height was 80 feet. The first 10 thuds, deads, shocked me. I looked up, saw that there were scores of girls at the windows. The flames from the floor below were beating in their faces. Somehow I knew that they too must come down. I even watched one girl falling, waving her arms, trying to keep her body upright until the very instant she struck the sidewalk. Then came the thud, then a silent unmoving pile of clothing and twisted broken limbs William Shepard by now dozens of women at a time could be seen standing at the eighth and ninth floor windows all but engulfed by the inferno as those below watched in horror groups of women three and four at a time grabbed each other by the hand closed their eyes, and plunged off the building. They hit the pavement just like rain, a stunned fire chief named Edward Worth later testified. 
Frances Perkins, a 31-year-old advocate with the Consumers League, stood with her hand at her throat, helpless to stop the unfolding tragedy. The nets were broken. The firemen kept shouting for them not to jump. But they had no choice. The flames were right behind them. For by this time, the fire was far gone. Francis Perkins. By 5.15, the scene on the street was a bedlam, as thousands of workers poured out of nearby factories and pressed against the barricades. Fire engine horses reared at the strong smell of blood, while police tried without success to control the crowd. The floods of water from the fireman's hose that ran into the gutter were actually stained red with blood. I looked upon the heap of dead bodies, and I remembered these girls were shirtwaist makers. I remembered their great strike of last year, in which these same girls had demanded more sanitary conditions and more safety precautions in these shops. These dead bodies were the answer. It was over in less than half an hour. Firemen inspecting the burned floors the next day found dozens of bodies, charred headless trunks, some still bent over the sewing machines. Among the remains, the inspectors found 11 engagement rings. In all, 146 people, teenagers for the most part, immigrant girls, some as young as 14, had died in the greatest industrial disaster in the city's history. Some died of smoke inhalation, piled against the doors trying to get out. Some died, were burned to death, and some jumped out of the windows and died. 141 young women died. Of course, when the, the fire men finally enter that building the dead bodies are heaped up against the doors because there were no fire exits there was no safety precautions march 26 1911 the remains of the dead it is hardly possible to call them bodies because that word would suggest something human and there was nothing human about most of these were taken in a steady stream to the morgue for identification. The New York Times. At a temporary morgue set up on a pier along the East River, relatives lined up to identify the corpses. The ghastly process took three full days. Seven bodies were so badly burned, they could not be identified. And on April 5th, 1911, a mass funeral was held for the unknown victims. 120,000 working people joined in the procession, despite a heavy rain, while 400,000 more watched silently from the sidewalk. A mass emotion of sorrow and despair was felt everywhere that day. But in the weeks that followed, these emotions gave way to angry questioning and a determination that a similar tragedy must never take place in New York again. A few months later, the owners of the Triangle Factory, Isaac Harris and Max Blank, were tried for manslaughter 
having locked their workers in. But to the shocked disbelief of the victims' families, and of most New Yorkers, the two men were acquitted when the prosecution was unable to prove that they had actually known that the exit door was locked at the exact time of the fire. There was a trial, and the trial found that the owners were not guilty, for they had broken no law. Yes, they might not have been very nice to have locked in these young women, but there was no law, and so there was no repercussion. Within weeks, the Triangle Factory had reopened in a nearby building. Visiting the new plant, fire inspectors found the exit door blocked by rows of sewing machines.